Welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from the Frontier. Thank you for stopping by. It's gotten a lot colder here in Arabia. It's our winter month or months. Um, and really, the temperature's not that cold. It's only about 16, but it certainly feels a lot colder. I think it's because of the altitude. Home thoughts. I'm so looking forward to getting back to the Masai Mara this week. Um, we needed to get away, and I said, look, let's just go and see the migration, because we never know when we'll get to see it again. This is a photograph from last year of the sunset in the Masai Mara. Uh, this was a Mara Fairmont, which was a lovely property. Um, and then I came across this, a zebra in the Masai Mara narrowly escapes a crocodile. And look how narrow it is, that escape. And then, unfortunately, it's taken down by two lionesses, and the entire thing is filmed from the air by someone in a hot air balloon. It's really remarkable. The Mara, what I like most is you know, the sense of distance, the vistas. And I took this photograph as we're going from the Mara Fairmont into the Mara Triangle, and I tweeted, nothing in front of us but the road to the Mara crossing through Maasai country. And then I came across this, History Scenes, a starry safari in the Maasai Mara National Reserve. And it took me back to Rudy. We come spinning out of nothingness, scattering stars like dust. And also, of course, nearly half of the atoms that make up our bodies may have formed beyond the Milky Way and travel to the solar system on intergalactic winds driven by giant exploding stars. Hot lava flows down the Mount Sinabung volcano in the night in Karo, North Sumatra. It looks pretty arresting, doesn't it? And if you're interested in the Mara, here's a map of the Maasai Mara by expert Africa. And I like this to round off my home thoughts from the Sachi Gallery, Rules of, opac of Opacity and Impermanence are up for debate in Filippo Minelli's series, Silences, Silence and Shapes. Political reflections, the US, Japanese and South Korean fighter jets flew over the Korean peninsula in a show of force against North Korea. President Trump tweeted, I'm very disappointed in China. Our foolish past leaders have allowed them to make hundreds of billions of dollars a year in trade, yet they do nothing for us in North Korea, just talk. We will no longer allow this to continue. China could easily solve this problem, he tweeted. And here's another photograph from AP of bombers flying over South Korea after North's second ICBM test. And my conclusions are he has a deterrent, and that's the overarching point and the lesson he learned from the demise of the likes of Muammar and Saddam. The first page of today's Rodong Sinmun features a banquet celebrating the second launch of the Hwasong 14 ICBM. China Xi Jinping has called for a strong army and tells troops at a parade the world isn't safe. For the 90th anniversary of the People's Liberation Army, China has displayed its modern arsenal in a grand parade. Take a look at this short video from DW News to get a sense of what they actually have, what kind of hardware. And he said, heed the party's order forever follow the party's step forever and always fight toward the direction where the party points. I concluded by saying he is on the front foot from the South China Seas up to Bhutan. Very interesting piece I came across in the LA Review of Books, Kill All Normies, can help us understand how the US elected a troll president. Online culture wars from 4chan, Tumblr to Trump and the alt-right 
Angela Nagel does two remarkable things. First, she situates the emergence of alt-right meme culture in a dialectical relationship to professional managerial class liberalism that's incarnated, she argues, by Barack Obama articulate erudite cosmopolitan. This timely intervention allows us to understand how the United States of America elected a troll president who delighted throughout his campaign in inflaming a sense of grievance while giving the finger to the first enemy of the culture war. Political correctness. Second, she provides the thick anthropological context for the emergence of the alt-right and its media-friendlier faces, which she calls the alt-light. Nagel's book is a highly readable, polemical, intellectual history of culturalism and the internet. It makes the case that there would be no Trump without the prankster sadism of meme culture. It's a credit to the book's critical sophistication that both ends of the identity politics spectrum feel aggrieved by Nagel's assessment of their tactics and their politics. Um, 755 US diplomats must leave Russia. This is what President Putin has announced. Um, and obviously he was waiting patiently and his patients uh, got worn out. Assange jumps in with anti ruler propaganda. In yellow is the original tweet. In blue is what they deliberately left out. Look, his bona fides have been trashed a long time ago. And each tweet of this nature trashes it some more. And that's why I was writing about Putin and Assange. And I quoted Don DeLillo. We have a deviate tomahawk from feeding the hothouse conspiracy frenzy online a constant state of destabilized perception, timely and judicious doses of WikiLeaks leaks, which drained Hillary's bona fides and her turnout to motivate Trump's. I said, what we have witnessed is something remarkable and noteworthy. Putin has proved himself an information master, and his adversaries are his information victims. Um, in Venezuela, 41.53% turnout for this vote that was called by the president. Venezuelans, however, continue to scramble for food, but it's often out of reach. And as I wrote in May this year, Maduro's Venezuela is at breaking point, and other capitals are going to run out of options as well. Third time unlucky, this is uh, the uh, Prime Minister of Pakistan, Nawaz Sharif. And uh, the person who actually launched this uh, court case against him was, of course, Imran Khan. And I came across an interesting story asking in the New York Times. I offered him a long time ago, but he declined. I don't know why Mr. Sharif said, patting Mr. Khan's shoulder, as everyone who had gathered around burst into laughter. In 1992, when Pakistan won its only Cricket World Cup, Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif was asked by a television host if the team captain, Imran Khan, a national heartthrob, would be right for his party if Mr. Khan went into politics. I offered him a long time ago, but he declined. I don't know why, Sharif said. Mr. Khan is a charismatic athlete, well known then for his playboy image and affairs with British socialites. I actually met him once at that time. He wasn't married to Jemima. Did not did go into politics a few years later through his own party. On Friday, the country's Supreme Court ruled that corruption accusations against Mr. Sharif, a veteran politician who thrice served as Prime Minister and has defined Pakistan politics for decades, was sufficient to remove him from office. For Mr. Khan, 64, the moment was sweet. He had been the main petitioner before the court and fomented widespread street protests against Mr. Sharif, emerging as the strongest challenger to the former prime minister and his political legacy. In some ways, this is a clear victory. There is no question about that. Mr. Yusuf, who is currently visiting Pakistan, said in an interview, 
saw Panama Papers scandal, PMLN, the ruling party, was sitting pretty for the next election. In my view, Imran Khan's path is not clear yet. The Saudi crown prince, who's now acting as king, Mohammed bin Salman, in the absence of his father, was on holiday, received the Iraqi Shia cleric and political leader Muqtada al-Sada um, in Jeddah yesterday. I'll put up a photograph. And this is surely very interesting and a little bit curious because, of course, he's previously said about the Iranians, how can I communicate with them while they prepare for the arrival? of Al-Mahdi Al-Montazar. In a National Interest article, I came across this. Indeed, eight presidents in Africa have now amassed more than 229 years in power between them. These include Eduardo dos Santos from Angola, 37, Teodora Obiang from Equatorial Guinea, 37, Paul Bia from Cameroon, 33, Idris Deby from Chad, 26, Denis Sassou Gueso, of Congo Brazzaville, 32, Yoweri Museveni, 31, Paul Kagame of Rwanda, 17, and Joseph Kabila of the DRC, 16. Al Shabaab attacked an African Union convoy, killing eight, but according to the Al Shabaab, they are saying they've killed 39. Um, they're showing that they are still a, a relevant currency markets. Let's take a look Euro dollar, 117.36. Um, remained within striking distance of 117.77, which was its strongest level since January 2015, set on Thursday. Dollar index is below that key level that I talked about for eternity of 93.50. We're at 93.34, 0.2% um, higher, trimming some losses after dropping 0.6% on Friday on a largely inline GDP print. Japanese yen, 110.51, Swiss franc, 0.9684, the Australian dollar, where's that, 0.7982, India rupee, 64.085, South Korean won, 1120.92, the real, where they've cut rates for the seventh time in 12 months, 3.1326, Egyptian pound, 17.9, and the rand just popped its head above 13, it's at 13.0109. According to David Inglis, positions on the dollar become more bearish as we move into this week. Net shorts at about a three-year high. Bloomberg dollar index at a two and a half year low. This is the apocalypse Trump I was writing about. Dollar index, uh, which is slightly different to the Bloomberg dollar index, um, is at 93.42. And the key level is 93.50. It really is make or break. Euro dollar. 117.36 looks a bit toppy to me, but let's see. The sentiment is so bullish uh, behind the euro right now. Rossellini's at Palazzo Avino in Ravello, photo court courtesy of Rossellini's. This is via Vogue magazine. Looked a rather attractive place to have lunch. And La Sponda at Siri News in Positano, photograph courtesy of La Sponda. Look tasty as well. Commodity markets gold. This is a chart from uh, T Commodity 1268.90. Um, it's an interesting conundrum. It should be up higher given that the dollar's fallen over 10% this year. Brent crude oil has, of course, rebounded very strongly. Last trading around $52.40. WTI is just shy of $50. And probably going to pop through 50 50 what's a level i remember when it got rejected last time so let's see how we behave when we get up to there global central bank update brazil has cut rates for the seventh time in the past year 100 basis points now nine and a quarter percent interesting report by jeffrey gettleman in the new york times loss of fertile land fuels looming crisis across africa Lykepia, Kenya, the two elders wearing weather-beaten cowboy hats with the strings cinched under their chins stood at the edge of an empty farm, covering their mouths in disbelief. Their homes, neat wooden cabins, had been smashed open, all their cattle had been stolen, so had their chickens. House after house stood vacant without another soul around. 
It was as if some huge force had barreled into the village and swept away all the life. Sieur Lysinko Lekisio, one of the elders, had no doubts about who did this. Swarms of herders from another county had invaded, attacking any farm or cattle ranch in their path, big or small, stealing livestock, ransacking homes, and shooting people with high-powered assault rifles. There's nothing we can do about it, he said. They want our land. Kenya has a land problem, Africa itself has a land problem, the continent seems so vast and the land so open. The awesome sense of space is an inextricable part of the beauty here, the unadulterated vistas, the endless land, but in a way that is an illusion. Population swells, climate change, soil degradation, erosion, poaching, global food prices, and even the benefits of affluence are exerting incredible pressure on African land. They are fueling conflicts across the continent from Nigeria in the west to Kenya in the east, including here in Laikipia, a wildlife haven in one of Kenya's most beautiful areas. Large groups of people are on the move, desperate for usable land. Data from NASA satellites reveals an overwhelming degradation of agricultural land throughout Africa, with one recent study showing that more than 40 million Africans are trying to survive off land whose agricultural potential is declining. And therefore, this article is interesting, isn't it? Because it's challenging that myth that the millions and millions of hectares available for farming. South African oil shares up 8.35% this year, dollar versus rand around the 13 level. Nigerian all shares at 34 month highs, it's up 37.17% year to date. Ghana Stock Exchange Composite Index is up 33.65% year to date. And that is at 24 month highs. I like this photograph of a child dragging firewood to his school in Aber, South Sudan. Albert F. G. Farrell. My piece over the weekend uh, is about the election, and I called it Youth Turnout Key in Elections. I learned last week that nearly half of the atoms that make up our bodies may have formed beyond the Milky Way and travelled to the solar system on intergalactic winds driven by giant exploding stars. Science is very useful for finding our place in the universe, said Daniel Anglis Alcazar, an astronomer at Northwestern University. In some sense, we are extragalactic visitors or immigrants in what we think of as our galaxy. Ruby said we come spinning out of nothingness, scattering stars like dust. I have digressed, but the tangential point is that our politics has been driven largely by a narrow ethnicity when we are all, in fact, intergalactic citizens. The 8th of August now looms real close, and as it gets closer, the cacophony outside my window overlooking Waiaki Way gets louder and louder. Most polls show this election is too close to call, but pollsters the world over have been getting it wrong from Brexit to Trump. If you look at the United Kingdom, the youth vote slept in during Brexit, then woke up for the UK snap election and nearly carried Jeremy Corbyn in 10 Downing Street. The newly enfranchised youth vote is a big absolute number of first-time voters and is a very big curveball. Is this youth vote turned on? Will it turn out? How will it vote? My view is that this demographic actually has the election in its hands. Will we see a youth quake? And if so, how does it break? The next issue, key issue, is turnout. Are voters on both sides motivated in the same way as they were last time? when the ICC proved a lightning rod in motivating voters in Jubilee strongholds. I was listening to Shafi Weru on his morning show on KISS FM, and he was regaling his listeners with a tale of about how a group of women were withdrawing conjugal rights from their menfolk 
as a way of compelling turnout and its direction. While Shafi was being tongue-in-cheek, as is his wont, he was touching on a key issue. This election can surely be won or lost on turnout, I recall a US congressman, a Hillary Clinton partisan who described to me how the Democrats never saw the Trump campaign on the ground, he said. We would see US flags, but nothing more. And yet, Cambridge Analytica and Jared Kushner, with help from the Russians and WikiLeaks, seriously motivated their core base via digital micro-targeting. Are Cambridge Analytica deploying a similar micro-targeting strategy? Will it work? Moving the dial a few percentage points might make all the difference. Beyond those big macro trends, we know there's been some erosion in what was a monolithic Rift Valley vote last time around. The amount of that erosion is key. How will Maasai land break? And it seems that Kambani is considered all to play for. LVMH's Hennessy Cognac CEO, Bernard Payon, was in town last week and he said, Kenya is a boost market. The next emerging market frontier for us, our role is to figure out what might happen in the world, to have a vision of what could become of Kenya. And we are positive. I agree with Payon, but the next few days are a pivot moment. The IEBC Kenya tweeted, one of our ICT managers has gone missing. The commission is working with police and family to establish his whereabouts. Ahmed Nasser, who's a lawyer here in Nairobi, says palpable panic, dark fear, threat of violence, chaos, mayhem, as we approach 8-8, show one simple thing, fragile institutions and no rule of law. Uh, Leon uh, Lidugu uh, tweeted, read the Daily Nation, this is the front cover. Kenya, according to Bloomberg, is denying opposition claim of plot for troops to ring vote. The Kenya government denied a claim by the main opposition group that it's planning to use force to rig next month's election and keep President Uhuru Kenyatta in office. NASA said Friday it had concrete evidence of an audacious plan to subvert the August 8th vote. The ruling Jubilee Party has clearly recognized it will be defeated and is organizing for regime-friendly army officers to implement plans including cutting power and water and militarily isolating some settlements on election day. The opposition group said in an email statement citing alleged confidential documents. Kenyatta accused the opposition of fabricating reasons for the election to be laid, to be delayed. Addressing a Friday rally in Western Kenya, he warned them against dragging our highly respected and disciplined security forces, including the Kenyan Defense Forces and Kenya police into petty politics. So you can see temperatures rising. Nairobi All Share closed at a fresh 25-month high. It rallied 1.76% on Friday, and it's up 20.88% year-to-date. Safaricom closed at a record high of 24.50, and that's up 33% on a total return basis. Kenjin is up 40.517% on a total return basis. NSE 20 closed at a 13.5-month high. That's up 19.22% year to date. So we've had a bullish market, it's an Africa-wide phenomenon, and uh, that's why it's hardly paused for breath, notwithstanding the proximity of the election. 